In a game for kids, they take out their machine gun and kill you. In the 21st century, in the United States, in Walmart. That's obscene. It's obscene. It's morally horrible. Is it different than Muslim kids being told to strap bombs and in the name of Allah and against American imperialism uh, go kill people? No, it's not. Now let's take Pope Benedict. Um, after John Paul. And you all know that some months ago he announced that the Catholic Church was the one true church. And that Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox were not too far away. That Anglicans were sort of in the distance. That Protestants were kind of on the map. Uh, nobody else was. We Jews weren't. I remind you, Abraham was our guy. Okay. Um, Muslims weren't, and the Dalai Lama isn't. We're all going to go to hell. Now, I, I sort of understand why the Pope is trying to gather his church together and maintain a sense of cohesion and membership. To be saying, in the 21st century, um, we have the one true church, is at, at, at a minimum divisive. It's worse than that. It's immoral. Okay, now, meanwhile, those of us who don't believe in God have, have in front of us books like, like Dawkins' books and the God Delusion. Dawkins is preaching to the billion of us who don't believe in God. It's easy to listen to Dawkins. He's telling us it's okay to not believe in God. And we partially applaud him. I know Richard, I've known him for years, and he's a superb writer. We partially applaud it and say, thank you for coming out of the closet. It's okay. We can have our morality. We don't have to have the God. And he's right. But he's saying to the billions of people who do believe in God, not all of whom are saying, let's kill in the name of God, most of whom are saying, I find meaning, solace, and so on. He's saying, you had to leave your brains behind when you went into church. So the first thing I want to say to you is, it's not going to work. Culturally, it's not going to work. It's going to fail. It's just going to alienate, if you will, the other side. So what I'm trying to write about is a middle way. And that's why I'm writing a book called Reinventing the Sacred. And I think we need to. What I'm going to talk about is a completely natural sense of God. I'm daring to use the God word. Maybe it's utterly stupid. It may be. It's certainly dangerous. It may turn out to be profoundly wise. I don't know. Um, but I think we need to talk about it. Now, with that introduction, I'm going to go into the actual talk. And I'm going to begin with a favorite poem of mine. So this talk sort of rambles on, because it's a big subject. This is by John Donne. I think you all know John Donne. He was an Elizabethan poet. At this point, Donne was a high Anglican churchman. It was written in 1615. Um, and it's one of his holy sonnets, number 14. And what I find so stunning about this poem and read to you, because I suspect that most of us don't believe in God, is to hear the anguish of an incredibly sensitive human being dealing with the tension between faith and reason. So listen to them. Batter my heart, three person to God. For you as yet but knock breathe, shine, and seek to mend. That I may rise and stand, or throw me, and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I like an usurped town to another do. 
labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you, and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again, take me to you, imprison me, for I except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. If you can't hear the power of that man's anguish between reason and faith, then I'll make you hear it again. I think it's just exquisite. Of the sensitivity of the time. Now, that was not the first time where there was a tension between reason and faith, but I want to draw two strands that follow out from roughly Dunn. Within, Dunn was writing in the time of Kepler, and we all know what Kepler did. He's one of our heroes. Um, within a hundred years, we had Newton, Newton's laws, the full sway of modern science was upon us, and uh, with it came reductionism, about which I'll talk in a moment. I think we still live in a reductionistic worldview, and I hope to show you tonight that that worldview is inadequate. So this is this book of mine, Reinventing the Sacred, is 80% of talk of science, or a book of science. Um, T.S. Eliot, and I think you all know Eliot, but anyway, he was a famous American Anglo poet, he's really American, but he escaped England. Um, wrote, perhaps accurately, perhaps not, that with the metaphysical poets of the Elizabethan era, Dunn and the others, for the first time in the Western mind, a split <coughs> arose between reason and the rest of human sensibilities. Well, I'm not sure it's the first time. The Greeks probably, you know, Plato wrote about a philosopher king, not a plumber king. Could have written about a plumber king, but uh, he didn't. Probably we wouldn't be reading it today. If it's not a uh, anyway, let's take it that Eliot's right. Within those few years we get to Newton, we get to the Enlightenment, we get to the age of reason, we celebrate reason as the highest faculty of humanity. And we downplay the rest of our humanity, our emotions, our intuition, our whatever, um, that I want to return to. And you'll see why we need it as we go along in this talk. With this split between reason and the rest of our sensibilities and the rise of science comes the split, come a bunch of injuries. One of them is the split <coughs> noticed by C.P. Snow in the two cultures between the sciences and, and literature and the arts and the humanities. Um, if you look in North America with various grudging comments among people who are humanists or social scientists, they tend to say, you know, we're practicing soft science. It's not the real stuff. It's not physics. We're really kind of second-class citizens. And they say, no, we're not. We're really 